Hello, this is the third in the uh, set of recordings, or at least technically it's the fourth recording because it was an introductory one, but the third um, letter in the OM alphabet that we'll be addressing in these various different podcasts. So today we're on to Fian, the, um, there we go, the third one there, the letter, which in, in English is the letter F. Um, so we'll explore some of the ideas and symbolism and imagery around Fian, um, much the same way we've done with previous podcasts. So the tree, which um, is not only associated with the letter Fian, but is actually the translation of what the name Fian means, is the alder tree, which um, has a variety of different qualities and traits to it. But one of the chief ones worth mentioning for the purpose of, of this uh, podcast is that it is a tree which particularly favours soggy, boggy soil. It tends to grow in sort of marshy, damp, dank areas and draws up a great deal of water. In fact, if you've got a very um, frequently waterlogged garden, then putting in a, an alder tree is one rather good way of trying to lighten your soil because it will drain quite a lot of water from that soil and make it maybe more suited for your garden. Um, so there's a practical benefit there. Um, as a tree that grows in soggy soil, the the, um, the the nature of the wood that that is part of the tree, once it's chopped down and sawn, sawed up into planks and so on, is that the wood is very water resistant. So this has led to it being used over the course of, of human history for a number of, of different things like bridge building, for example, um, and putting in the foundations of houses in areas which themselves are, again, very damp because it gives a sort of water resistance to the building, as well as making things like buckets and other um, vessels that you would be tipping liquids into. Um, this is reflected in a number of different traditions and aspects. We'll do the... Um, the Bjaha Oum first, the, the, the three uh, little sentences, you, again, can't really call them poetry, can you, but little sentences that give some kind of uh, symbolism to understanding the meaning and, and the imagery and the semiotics of these letters. So one of them is uh, translates into English as milk container. In other words, if you prefer to be a little bit more prosaic, a milk bucket. Uh, so the the, uh, the milkmaids would be down there milking the cans of the, as they've done for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, um, putting the milk into buckets and carrying the buckets back up. Often those buckets were made from alder wood for this very reason I've just mentioned, that the wood is highly water resistant and lasts much longer than a number of other types of wood would do if they were used to make buckets. Uh, so you could see in this context the imagery of a container. You could just take that very literally. This this, this um, brehar organ is, is no, nothing more than a reference to the practical usage of the wood, making buckets. Also, perhaps if you want to look for a deeper meaning as a container, as a holder, you could get all terribly Jungian on that one and say that the wood is very good at holding and containing um, fluid forces, giving them shape, giving them... Um, containment. So if you, again, want to stick with a bit of a Jungian theme there, emotions are particularly associated with water, they're very fluid, they, they sort of chop and change all of the time. People can you love somebody one minute and hate them the next and go back to loving them a minute after that. They're always moving and fluid and shifting and turning. How do you contain all of that? Well, Fian is the image of a force which is strong enough, rigid enough, impermeable enough to contain all of those emotions sloshing around without being overwhelmed by them, without being drowned by them. And if we didn't have, let's say in this case, perhaps we'll use the image of the intellect, which in Jungian terms, air and water balance each other out, the water of emotion and the air of intellect. If you didn't have the intellect to provide a, a strong container for your emotional life, you would be a soggy mess all over the place. You just spill out everywhere. And there are, I dare say, um, some of the people watching this will perhaps know individuals who are so <sighs> gushy and over-emotional and, and shifting from love to hate and back again in, in a course of seconds that they are all over the place and they're uncontained. And uh, yeah, the internet is full of people describing themselves as empaths because they, they rightly or wrongly, um, 
shift in and out of other people's emotions and their own emotions and they don't know where they end and other people begin until they learn to contain and control the ability that is at any rate you can be so empathic that you become as, as much use as a chocolate teapot to anyone because you no longer know where your own boundaries are you no longer know how to distinguish between yourself and other people or you're so overwhelmed by their grief and their unhappiness that it renders you next to useless as well and that is not a good state to be in so as much as very watery people in the Jungian sense of the word feeling types often consider intellectual airy types to be cold fish there is a, a benefit from having a touch of the cold fish to help contain those emotions Jung himself uh, introduced this concept of uh, an dramia. he said that when you because he spoke of the four forces which he associated with the four elements of Greek mythology earth, air, fire, water they reflect into different traits of the human mind and he said if you have too much of one nature or some deeply rooted instinct within yourself which you may as well call nature for lack of a better word um, seeks to balance itself out by turning towards the polar opposites it's all very yin yang in which uh, the yin seeks the yang and the yang seeks the yin so air seeks water and water seeks air earth seeks fire and fire seeks earth to help balance it out when one of those forces becomes so overwhelming so strong that the person's in danger of self-destruction how the um, the other forces sort well Jung said quite often we are drawn to people who embody strongly the element that we are particularly lacking in ourselves because we we need that element to balance out the excess of the element that we do have uh, we could uh, perhaps some future podcasts go into the idea of the jeweler which is the sort of um, the Gaelic Irish and Scots Gaelic notion of, of the elements uh, in Celtic tradition it's not common to talk of four elements in, in a lot of early Irish poetry it was far more common to talk of either seven elements or nine elements and some of those elements it were things like the, the sea the mountains thunder various different forces of nature and, and so rather than looking at a, a set of four we might be looking at an odd numbered set within the Celtic understanding and you could still go with that sort of Jungian notion that even where they're talking of elements of the natural world these elements of the natural world also echo into psychological aspects of our own being and, and physical aspects of our own bodies um, a, a lot of elementalism was used up until just a few hundred years ago in medicine so you, uh, a medieval doctor or a 16th 17th century doctor so you, your humors are out of balance you've got far too much phlegm you don't have enough sanguinity in your system you've got to change your diet you've got to do this do that do the other to balance out your humors because in balanced humors are perceived as causing disease and illness which is still an idea very very current in um, Indian medicine and in Chinese traditional medicine the, there are the, the, different names are used obviously and, and in Chinese traditional medicine there's five elements rather than the four but it's a similar sort of notion that there are forces that compose not only the mind but the body and if they become out of tilt disease ill health mental instability various problems ensue and that there are various practical steps both changes in diet changes in exercise um, medications herbal medications this sort of thing which can be taken to achieve a greater degree of balance not something that mainstream western scientific medicine tends to go for anymore but that yeah let's face it mainstream western medicine came from roots in the the older um, Greek styles of medicine and beliefs in elements and powers so again different cultures have different numbers we could look in some future podcast to discussing the nine elements or the seven elements and how that might have reflected in the understanding of ancient peoples ancient Celtic tribes around uh, health and illness and so forth um, where were we buckets yes so buckets of milk going back to that you could see it in that the, the idea of a containing force which gives shape to things that are often too fluid for their own good um, and, and lack shape lack form and just the flow all over the place uh, another of the three um, 
is a vanguard of warriors. Sometimes vanguard, the word vanguard is translated as shield, uh, Aranach. Uh, it can, can be shield or vanguard. Um, the shield one is quite a popular translation because the alder wood was a very popular wood to use in making um, warriors' shields. It's quite strong, it's quite tough. It takes blows from swords and axes and arrows thudding into it without you know, splitting and giving way and leaving the warrior vulnerable. And a vanguard even again comes, comes at the rear and protects soldiers from being attacked at the rear. So it's in both translations you've got this idea of protection. Which sort of, I suppose, overlaps a little bit with the bucket imagery. The bucket contains, protects the milk or whatever the other liquid might be on other occasions from flooding all over the place. And I suppose protects your carpet from getting soaked. Not that they had carpets in their major houses, but you get the idea. Um, so both are sort of dealing with protective forces. And if you're thinking of the Oum in terms of chanting, in terms of talismans, in terms of ritualistic magical use, it is a force of power that can be turned to when you are feeling vulnerable and you want something that will give you a degree of protection and shielding and containment because you feel a bit all over the place and you feel uncontained like like the milk leaking up onto the floor or as with the warrior's shield you want something there to protect you from hostile forces and let's face it we all encounter at some point hostile forces whether it's just that snipey twat that you work with who's very unpleasant towards you or maybe you live in a very dangerous neighborhood where muggings and violence and, and or domestic crime and you know, all sorts of things take place or at the even more extreme example you could be living in a war zone or something like that and you might need all kinds of protection for yourself and for your loved ones so um, it, as, as a force as an energy to call upon to focus upon to concentrate your mind upon in meditation and so forth um, that protective element is there which is also echoed in the third of the Dinkridi, protection of the heart. Uh, we don't really know how the Iron Age peoples understood the relationship between organs and psychological functions. So we know with the Egyptians, for example, they believed the heart was the containment of intellectual force rather than the brain. So they would, um, when somebody died, place the heart in a canopic jar. The brains got scraped out and largely just chucked away rather than being preserved. Having met a number of people, that may not always be an inadvisable interpretation. Um, these days, obviously, we think of the brain as the sort of as the source rather, sorry, of intellect as the chair of, of intellectual function. We no longer think of the heart as that. We think of the heart symbolically at least, metaphorically, as, as compassion and kindness and love and affection. How did the ancient Irish or the ancient British or the ancient Gauls think of different traits associated with different body parts? Did they think the intellect was in the head or in the heart or some other bit of the anatomy? We just don't really know. There may be untranslated documents that will answer that question one day when they get translated, but at the moment it's just guesswork. So. When it says protection of the heart, we can't be absolutely certain how people back then understood the heart, although we can turn to things like poetry. So there's a lovely poem which is read, or spoken I should say, uh, by Cuchulain, the great warrior of Ulster, over the dead body of his best friend and companion, Ferdia, who... Um, Cuchulain is from Ulster and Ferdia is from Connaught, and they are tricked into fighting each other by the... Um, Machiavellian, Machiavellian schemings of Queen Maeve and Cuchulain wins but it is rather a pyrrhic victory in that by winning it was he saves his own life but he kills his very best friend and there is an implication in the poems that he sings over his, his friend's grave that perhaps they were rather more than just chums they're, 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 this might have been a much more intimate relationship than that but he refers to him as his uh, the friend of his heart, which um, if, if you reach an age where talking about boyfriends and girlfriends starts to feel a bit kind of teenager and cheesy, referring to someone to whom you are not married, but who is your, your uh, paramour, your beloved, as the friend of your heart, the, your heart's companion, that, that sounds rather more poetic and rather lovely and somewhat more mature than just, oh, it's my boyfriend, it's my girlfriend. So it seems a bit more, you know, 
and sophisticated. Um, so in the sense, me companion of the heart, friend of the heart, it suggests the heart again as affection and love and romance in the way that we understand it in the modern day uh, West. So maybe they also understood it that way in much, much earlier times in Ireland and perhaps by extension Britain and Gaul and so on. So the protection of the heart, we could take that to mean protection of your tender feelings from being uh, abused and exploited and, and um, I know, cheated upon or whatever. Your heart might be hurt in various different, fairly obvious ways. So uh, again, thinking chanting and talismans and things of a magical nature. For someone who is particularly emotionally vulnerable to abuse and exploitation, maybe they've just come out of a rather grim relationship, or they are feeling that their current relationship is going through a very, very rocky patch, that this is something that, again, is a kind of a, a mantra to chant in meditation, that sort of thing, as, as a, a way of protecting your heart from being damaged unnecessarily from, from the, the, the blows of misfortune. In terms of colour, uh, we have here the colour flan, which translates as blood red, which goes nicely with the protection of the heart imagery. A bit of um, arterial blood pumping around there. Uh, also perhaps an image of potential vulnerability, you know, the warrior stands guard protecting people, but they are usually the first one to take the, the wounds of whoever is attacking whoever they are defending their loved ones from. So it's often their blood red spillage that's that's the cost of the protection afforded to their loved ones, to the people they're looking after, they're guarding or protecting. And there is a general feeling of guardianship within Fian, um, that this is a, a force that stands guard over others. So whether as in you want to visualize that as some big early nightclub bouncer um, regulating who gets into, for example, a sacred space. There's no direct connotation, at least none that I'm aware of at any rate, with the goddess Nematona, who is the goddess of the sacred place, who is a bit like a kind of a, a bouncer, a guardian, a protector of a, a holy spot that only certain people in the right state of mind should be allowed into, and that no one who is disruptive or, or destructive should be allowed into such a place. Because there is no surviving connection doesn't mean there might not have been at an earlier point in time, but the, the alder tree I like to visualise as a kind of a guardian tree planted at the entranceway to regulate who goes through into the holy place on the other side, which should be a place of peace and quiet and calm and sanctity, so that making sure no dodgy characters get into that, no, no destructive forces get into that. Um, in the Druish tradition, the, the use of the um, oh, the word escapes, not mezuzah, that's the candlestick. Um, this, do I mean tefillin? Oh, I can't quite remember that. I'll have to double check the word and put it up onto the block. Um, the, a little prayer on a scroll that is placed in a little metal box that's nailed to the doorway of a, a Jewish household. Well, it's a devout Jewish household at any rate which is there again to protect the house and the people within the house from burglars, from vandals, from, and obviously particularly for Jewish people who've got a long history of being subject to persecutions from all sorts of harassment and, and unwanted attention and not just unwanted human attention, horrible neighbours and people like that, but also dangerous spiritual forces like the Dibuk, um, sort of uh, chaotic, destructive ghosts and demonic forces and what have you that exist as part of Jewish uh, folklore and, and that the little prayer scrolls are there to protect from. So you could, um, if, if you were going down this spiritual path rather than the Jewish one, um, use Fian as a talisman that would go on the front door of your house to protect your house from anything, be it human or uh, spirit or anything that's basically you know, rats and, and other type of unwanted creatures getting into your house and causing destruction and mayhem. It becomes a, a sort of a protective um, presence, a preserver of the sanctity of the home, because your home is a sacred space. It's not just temples and, and druid groves and stone circles and those sorts of very grand romantic places that are holy places. Your home is a holy place too, and it should be treated as such. 
That's why in some cultures you take your shoes off and partly that's about you know not wanting to walk a load of cow shit or something on the bottom of your shoe into somebody's house. But it's also the idea that just as you would take your shoes off going into a temple, so you should take your shoes off going into someone's home. So there's a bit of sort of echoing of this idea of the home as a sacred place. Um, not somewhere for lots of shouting, screaming and teenage door slamming, but as a sacred place, a sanctuary to come home to at the end of the day from the excesses of the world around. Uh, the bird oem associated with this phelan is the seagull, which is a curious image because there, there's no other particular kind of sea-related oceanic imagery tied into Fian. Um, I, I cannot yet find any particular association in, in myth and so on with water trees or Fian or, or what have you, and let's say Mananao Maclear or any of the other deities related to the ocean, simply this connection to the seagull. But there may have been a connection in myth, and uh, that myth has either just been completely lost over the passage of history, or is in some untranslated manuscript waiting to be brought to light. Um, how do we understand the imagery of the seagull? Well, seagulls don't particularly crop up in surviving uh, Celtic mythology. Let's see if there's more dog. There we go. Um, but they, they may have been stories in which they were more prominent in uh, previous entries, and, and just again, those stories are untranslated or what have you. Uh, but it's, it's easy to read into the image of the sea god the idea of a messenger of the sea gods uh, bearing to and fro messages to and fro from the, the gods and forces of the sea and back to the gods and forces of the sea. Um, so potentially, uh, maybe if you're engaging in overwater travel, if you're a bit of a nervous traveller, or prone to seasickness, then <laughs> maybe you want to meditate upon Fian before engaging in that, or seek safe communion, safe passage across water. Um, here it's obviously we're thinking salt water rather than the usual uh, sweet water, which is what old trees grow by. They don't do well, besides the seaside, in very salty soil. It's fresh water that they, they thrive within and, and, and that kind of soggy, marshy, brackeny water, rather than salty, brackeny, salty water. Um, there's a, a section in a book by Lady Wilde, Oscar Wilde's mother, who was also a great writer and a collector of folklore, and what have you, where she talks about a lot of Irish folk traditions in the Victorian era. Um, one of these Irish folk traditions is the association of two trees with babies. Um, and that the, the parents or grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever, wanting to protect the infant should hang twigs from different trees over the, the cradle or the crib of the infant. For a, a little girl it should be rowan twigs and for a little boy it should be alder twigs. So how far back that tradition goes, I know a lady who I didn't know, I don't think anybody else knows either for that matter, how far back in time that one goes. It may be a relatively recent thing, a few hundred years old, or it may be something that dates back a long time to ancient beliefs and traditions and perhaps the perception that the alder was a more masculine sort of a tree and the rowan a more feminine sort of a tree, perhaps. So you can kind of take that on board for what it is worth and maybe you know, if, if you are uh, designing a baby naming ceremony for a newborn or you want to give some little protective device for the parents to, to hang near the crib, then something made out of alder wood could be highly appropriate for that one. The wood also gives us three different colours of, of dye used in cloth dyeing, um, black, red and green from different parts of the tree, that uh, again the, the red goes with the blood red image of, of flan, the, the, the green and black doesn't tie in with the surviving law, but um, you could, for example, dye cloth using various different parts of the alder tree, and that could be used either as ritual wear or for you know, making little bags you can sew together and put all the twigs in or whatever it is that you want to do. You could use that in a whole variety of different contexts and ways. Um, last two things to, very, to finish on fairly quickly. The number of them is the number three. And Irish mythology, Welsh mythology, etc., is up to its ear holes in imagery associated with the number three. The triads of Welsh mythology and, and lots and lots of different um, groups of beings and, and people and gods and, and spirits and whatnot 
that go around in groups of three. Some of them are dark and scary ones, like the three female werewolves that come out of the cave of Kruachan Ai, and some of them are much more positive, joyful figures. So you've got a whole range of um, beings who go around in groups of three, and three is perhaps the most dominant number in Irish and Welsh and so forth mythology. Why? Well, that your guess is as good as mine. Different cultures favour different numbers. In Chinese mythology, the number five crops up a great deal. In um, Christian symbolism, the number seven crops up a great deal. Um, in Celtic cultures, it's the number three. Who knows why, but it does. Some people go for the idea of the numbers one and two representing masculine and feminine forces. So the father, the mother, and the number three becomes the child of the union. And uh, numerologists in various different cultures and traditions often associate three with good fortune and luckiness in general, and also creativity, again, that idea of the, of the child of the union, perhaps. Um, and uh, moving beyond the polarity of male and female, that's something I quite like and think is worth noting that for a very long time in European culture, we've had dualism as very dominant. Under Christianity, God and the devil, good and evil dark and light, night and death, um, with the, this sort of um, polarising of, of men and women into rival camps, rather than seeing them as uh, as part of the same species helping each other, there's often a tendency to dichotomize men into one group and women into another, and you get well, men are from Mars and women from Venus and all this stuff that goes on to try and, and widen the gap rather than bridge the gap between the two. Uh, a lot of cultures use dualistic imagery religion versus science, all this kind of thing. And it's, it's often underpinned by a sense of hostility and conflict between two forces. And that, I think, if you kick the arse out of it too much, gets very, very destructive. It puts everyone into an either-or mentality. Um, it, something is, is true or it's false. It's one or the other. There's, there's no kind of middle ground between anything. It's, a person is good or they're evil. There's no middle ground. They're, they're this or they're that. They're, and again, it's, it's always oppositional, it's conflicting, it's promoting um, division when it should, culture should strive to bring people together, not rip them apart. So moving from a duality, the next thing on, of course, is, number, is the number three. So the idea that rather than looking for either this or that, consider a third option, that there are other ways. There's more than two ways of doing a thing more than two options in any given situation, well, almost any given situation, to try and think, to use a cheesy phrase, outside the box of other ways of doing stuff, and being more creative, coming back to creativity there in solutions. So when this comes up in a reading, usually I tend to think of it in terms of protection. Either the individual is in receipt of protection, or they need to give protection to someone else who is vulnerable. Or maybe it's an emphasis sometimes that they are vulnerable and need to find greater protection in their own life. They, they need something as a, a gatekeeper, a guardian of the doorway, to very much consider who they let in. And if you are a fan of vampire folklore, you know that a lot of European cultures have this tradition that when the vampire knocks at your door or your window, it can't actually come into your house to rip your throat out unless you are dozy enough to invite it in. And once you've done that, well, you know, it's open season. So how far you take that, I mean, you can kind of milk that imagery a bit much, but that some forces, at least, sometimes there are destructive forces that need to be invited into our hearts, back to the protection of the heart, invited into us, that they don't just boot their way in. They have to be welcomed, and therefore you should be awfully careful about who and what you welcome in, to your place of sanctuary, to your heart, to your mind, to your home. It could crop up in a reading if someone's considering taking in a lodger and you know, a person who's about to apply to be their lodger is the last person on earth they should be allowing into their home. <laughs> it, it doesn't have to be anything too metaphysical, it could be something quite practical in the sense that there are you know, risks in opening yourself up and your home up to people and forces you know little about and might be easily suckered in by because they look okay at first glance but there's something deeply wrong there that's hidden away and you are advised not to make yourself vulnerable in that way. 
So in a reading, it's uh, maybe striking a note of caution sometimes. But also, if we go for this kind of movement beyond duality into third options, maybe it's a reminder to people not to be um, too suckered into conflict and confrontation and assuming everything is a battle. Um, winners and losers, that kind of thing. That there are third options, other alternatives. That they need to think of, of other ways around rather than getting stuck in this black and white thinking, which is unhealthy. Last little bit, Rocky, I'm rambling on a lot, aren't I? Last little bit to think of in Welsh um, poetry. You've got the um, the Cadgothai, the Battle of the Trees, which is a long poem, so a relatively relatively late written one, which many uh, academics, historians regard as not so much mystical, more satirical. They, they think it was a bit of a bit of a piss take of a poem rather than one with lots of deep profound metaphysical meanings to it which is to tend to be how modern day pagans have taken it as a, something mystical but it's, it's all about a, a punch up a battle between various different forests trees forces within the forests and i'll just mention whether it's satirical or not, i'll just mention that one of the the verses in the poem uh, describes how Gwydion, the, the god who is quite a, a, a trickster sort of a character in Welsh mythology, identifies somebody on the other side of the army, the other army, as being Bran the Blessed, because he has alder twigs upon his shield. And it's very specific about it being alder twigs, and that Bran carries the alder. Bran is the great giant of Welsh mythology. Bran, Bendigate Bran, who um, goes to war with Ireland to avenge the honour of his sister, Branwen, who has been badly treated by her Irish husband. Bran means raven, the raven king, the raven god. And there's a whole body of law in that that we could think about and go into. Interesting, it's raven and not sea god. But there we go. Anyway, um, the other bird in that story is the starling, which he gets trained to fly across the waves by Branwen carrying a message pleading for help from her brother, but again, not a seagull, but, but that's besides the point. Um, Bran, in, a, in a, uh, another part of the story, leads his people into Ireland, wades across the ocean, because he's a huge giant, he just wades across the, the entire ocean, pulling a fleet of ships behind him. And they get into Ireland, and the Irish seeing them coming, they've fled across the river Liffey and burned all the bridges behind them, so that they hope to strand the the, uh, the Welsh forces on the, the wrong side of the river. But Bran lays down across the length of the river. He's so long that his ankles are on one bank of the river and his wrists are on the other bank of the river. And he says very uh, significantly that he who would be king be a bridge. And he orders his soldiers to, to walk and ride across his back. And that's how they go over to the other side of the Liffey. And um, well, things happen, but that's a whole other story. And that is quite a significant image for leadership, the idea that the king isn't just some pompous ass with a crown on his head. He is someone who should be a bridge between peoples. You can read that in terms of diplomacy, bridging between rival forces. You can read it metaphysically, a bridge between this world and the spirit world, as you know, gods and humans and whatnot go back and forth between the two worlds. You can read it in a number of different contexts. But of course, the key thing here in terms of Fiam is that bridges are traditionally built out of alder wood, or at least the, the, the legs of the bridges that go down into the river are built out of alder wood because it is water resistant. It will out, outlast most other types of wood once it's sunk into water. So that the, the alder king should be associated with bridges fits well with the imagery. And again, you, if you're looking at readings, divinatory readings, maybe this could signify the need to be a bridge between two worlds, two hostile forces or something, and the person is the diplomat, the bridge to go between between conflicting forces. Um, but also that leadership is about serving your people, not poncing around in, in fancy bling and uh, lording it over people. Quite the reverse, it is about service, which is why people used to wear these as a reminder that they were servants of the community, not lording it over the community. They say some of them needed more than a bit of bling as a reminder of that. <laughs> Never mind. Um, so again, in terms of connecting Welsh myth and Irish myth, they're not two completely separate worlds, they are interrelated worlds. Um, Bran the Blessed, the Raven King, is someone to meditate on communally and think about 
his story and his imagery and his significance if you're trying to get a deeper understanding of Fian as a letter in the Oum alphabet. So it's a where it links between the Irish source and Welsh British uh, manifestations. But I've, I've waffled on quite long enough, so I'll leave that one here. Um, and uh, any questions, do ask. Thank you.